The knuckleball is a phenomenon that has been utilised in many sports, including baseball, football, cricket and volleyball. Its random flight through the air seems to defy our common understanding of projectiles, and if you want to find out more about how these shots can even exist in the first place, keep watching. The knuckleball has been around for a while, with reports claiming it to be a phrase used as early as 1908. The term itself comes from the way in which the ball is pitched in baseball, as it is thrown off the knuckles. The slow, yet deceptive way of throwing the ball is designed to put batters off due to the random course which the ball can take through the air, and this technique was taken up in football for exactly the same reason. Its erratic path through the air means it is a hard shot to save. In fact, as I mentioned at the start of this video, it's not just baseball and football that have adopted this technique, but also cricket, volleyball and even tennis. So what's going on with the knuckleball, and why is it used in so many sports? To find out, I went to my local park and, as a diligent physicist, did some research and experimentation. However... Being a physicist also has its drawbacks. I even had to resort to using footage from a few years back to find any decent shots on target. You see, to shoot a knuckleball, you need to impart very little or no spin at all onto the ball when you kick it. And, while most of my shots were off target, when I did get an okay shot in, the ball was still spinning and so didn't give the effect that we were after. As you can tell, I'm not a very good footballer, but it can take months, even years of practice to perfect this shot. But, why is this shot so difficult to achieve in the first place? As I said, in order to get the knuckleball effect, you have to kick the ball so that there is no spin on it as it travels through the air. If we first consider the case where I kicked the ball with spin, we see that to get the ball spinning, we need to apply a torque to the ball which is equal to the force applied multiplied by the perpendicular distance from the ball's center of mass. If we hit the ball even further to the right, we would apply an even greater torque to the ball as the distance has increased. However, we want to kick the ball in such a way that we apply zero torque to it, meaning that the foot has to travel in a line of motion that goes through the centre of mass of the ball. This is why you are often told to hit the ball slightly below the centre, as this is the point at which the ball will not spin once kicked, while not applying a torque on it as viewed from the side, so that it also travels upwards. This is tricky to pull off due to the accuracy you need to hit the ball with, and also due to the irregular shape of your foot, hence the difficulty I was having at the park. This still doesn't explain the stochastic nature of the ball's flight when it has no spin though, as we are very used to shots with backspin or topspin being very stable in their side-to-side -side motion, but can curl down or hang in the air longer, so surely a non-rotating ball will be stable in both of these axes. However, we know that this is not true, and to explain it, we need to delve into the wonderful world of fluid dynamics. Fluid dynamics is, funnily enough, the study of how fluids interact with moving objects. Fluids can be liquids or gases, and so this area of engineering and science is applicable to many industries, namely the aerospace industry. However, it can also be applied to the flight of a sphere through air, and this is what we will be studying to reveal any answers the air itself may hide. For a random flight through the air, we would expect a random change in turbulence and pressure behind the ball as it moves, which would induce a change in the direction of the ball. The reason as to why these random forces arise is at the heart of the knuckleball problem, and it could be down to the composition of the ball itself. If you consider a baseball, you will see that it is not a truly round sphere, but has loads of seams all over it. These seams will interact with the air in a different way to the smoother panels covering it, and so will give a different flow of air. This could lead to a random change in turbulence behind the ball, especially if it is rotating slowly, which would cause a change in the airflow around the ball. In fact, if you add the effects of the seams and the different orientation of the ball, this could be enough to give the required random airflow and hence random flight of the ball. This is an argument that has been used to explain the knuckleball effect for some time, but it does have one major issue with it. You see, the seam theory is all well and good when describing baseballs, but if you now turn your attention to a football, you will see that it is much smoother than a baseball. In fact, the 2010 World Cup ball, the Jabulani, 
was much smoother than anything else previously made and was observed to have a very large knuckleball effect. So what's going on here? How can a smoother sphere create more turbulence than seams on a baseball? To start with, I'd like to state that the baseball and football can't be directly compared due to their difference in size, but the point still remains the same. Smooth footballs can randomly move from side to side during their flights. If you're still skeptical, the knuckleball effect can be observed using a table tennis ball, and even with perfectly smooth marbles being dropped into water. The knuckleball effect was studied in depth in a paper from 2016, and the results are truly remarkable. Before I talk about that though, I first need to introduce two key terms in fluid dynamics, laminar flow and turbulent flow. Laminar flow can be thought of as the smooth flow of fluid around an object, where the flow can be divided up into many parallel layers, hence the term lamina. On the other hand, turbulent flow can be thought of as a chaotic process in which the fluid flow around an object results in erratic changes of pressure and velocity. Now, what the researchers verified was that something special happens at a point known as the drag crisis, and this is the point at which the drag force for our sphere dramatically decreases with an increase in speed. How can this happen though, as we normally think of drag force being proportional to an object's velocity squared? What's happening is that the flow of air around the sphere is going from laminar to turbulent, which gives a decrease in drag force. This is why golf balls have a dimpled surface. The drag crisis for a rough sphere occurs at a lower speed than for a smooth sphere, so the golf ball can be hit further. The underlying mechanics of why the drag force decreases is to do with the boundary layer of air which encases the surface of an object, but is beyond the scope of this video. However, there is some useful information to explain the knuckleball effects that we can glean from the boundary layer theory. As I said, the boundary layer is a thin film of air which encases any object moving through air, and is the reason why your car can remain dusty even after going down the motorway. The boundary layer of air where the dust sits is stationary, so it doesn't move the dust at all. Something special happens at the drag crisis of our sphere though, and it involves the boundary layer. The boundary layer is subject to intermittent reattachments to the ball, giving a side with laminar flow and a side with turbulent flow. This process is random and so either side can be turbulent at any one given point. It's this constant detachment and reattachment of the boundary layer which generates random turbulence either side of the ball, and since turbulent air has a lower pressure than the laminar flow of air on the other side, the ball is pushed in this direction. An instant later, the boundary layer may separate on the other side, and the ball will be pushed the other way. This phenomenon was the main subject of the paper, and to investigate it, they used a motorised rotating metal plate to launch a ball with no rotation, far more effective and accurate than my research at the park. Another interesting point I picked up from this paper was that, as the drag crisis occurs at a given speed for a certain ball, this will affect the velocity at which the ball is projected in different sports, giving optimum values of speed for that given ball. For instance, in baseball, a knuckleball is known to be a slower moving ball, and this is because the drag crisis for a baseball occurs between velocities of 28 and 36 meters per second, far slower than the maximum recorded velocities of around 54 meters per second. The same applies to football, with knuckleball velocities typically ranging from 20 to 25 meters per second. So, to conclude, it seems that there are two ways in which the knuckleball effect can be achieved, by using a ball with seams on it, but also due to the drag crisis phenomenon. Both of these methods combined give an overall effect which has been deployed by sports people with huge success, and will remain a completely unpredictable shot in its flight. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, then you may enjoy a look at the day-to-day -day workings of our world. Just click here.